This slideshow is designed to give you the latest information on a relatively new field in science, neuroscience, and how this field has led to discoveries about the brain that will impact the field of education today and into the future. Leslie Hart was one of the first educators to make the connection between um, brain research and its application to the classroom. And he states, education is discovering the brain and that's about the best news there could be. Anyone who does not have a holistic grasp of the brain's architecture, purposes, and main ways of operating is as far behind the times as an automobile designer without a full understanding of engines. Prior to the 1990s, we often made decisions about teaching um, based on behaviors of students because we couldn't see inside the brain to know exactly what was going on when someone was learning. During the 1990s, all the way up to the year 2000, a whole new set of imaging technologies were created and those technologies helped not only give us a better understanding of the brain and how it functions, but allowed us to see inside the brain. That will definitely give us some, some feedback on teaching and learning. The new discipline in science, known as neuroscience, involves the study of the nervous system, including the brain, spinal cord, and networks of sensory nerve cells, or neurons, throughout the body. The focus of research in neuroscience has been on describing the human brain and how it functions normally, determining how the nervous system develops, matures, and maintains itself, as well as finding ways to prevent or cure neurological and psychiatric disorders. Up until this point, it has not been on education, but that may change in the future. The discipline of neuroscience is rather interdisciplinary. It includes fields such as biology, chemistry, and physics. And the emphasis is on the structure, the physiology, and behavior, including human emotional and cognitive functions associated with the brain and learning. Fields of study within neuroscience include neuroanatomy, developmental neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, behavioral neuroscience, and clinical neuroscience, with more fields being created as we speak. One of the tools to used to help us see inside the brain is the electroencephalography, otherwise known as EEG. What happens with an electroencephalography is that electrodes are placed on a particular part of a patient's scalp and it records electrical signals from the brain. Uh, this allows the technician to see the brain activity when neurons respond to a specific event and that brain activity gets recorded on a graph and the technician then interprets what part of the brain um, is involved in. Another device, known as the magnetoencephalography machine, otherwise known as the MEG, measures magnetic fields that emanate from the head during brain activity. This particular device is able to provide the most accurate resolution of the timing of nerve cell activity down to the millisecond. Computerized axial tomography, otherwise known as CAT scans, also provide useful information about what's going on inside the brain. The CAT scan uses multiple x-rays to generate images of the brain um, and also other internal organs. Those scans can be used to detect brain damage and also can highlight where the blood is flowing um, and the activity of the brain. Positon emission tomography or PET scans also provide information about the brain and its activity. What happens in a PET scan is that a small amount of radioactively tagged glucose is injected into a, the bloodstream of the subject. Traces it, tr this particular device traces where blood flows in the brain. So the higher levels of blood flow means a larger amount of the tracer has made it to that part of the brain. 
In a normal brain, you'll see the uh, most active areas in yellow and red. And then in a brain maybe that's not functioning as well as it should be, the uh, darker areas, greens and blues, indicate uh, less activity. The magnetic resonance imaging machine, otherwise known as MRI, um, places a patient in a tunnel-like structure, and within that structure there are radio waves that pass through a magnetic field around the patient, and this gives a 3D image of some internal structure. In this case, we focus on the brain. The functional magnetic resonance imaging machine, or fMRI, measures the signal generated by protons of water that are inside the nerve cells so that when someone is active and blood is flowing to a particular part of the brain then that means the distribution of water and blood changes and the fMRI can locate what part of the brain is getting more oxygenated blood so in the picture that you see on the screen when you're hearing something um, the darker area in blue is where the brain is operating the most heavily and when you're seeing something it's the back of the brain um, that's highlighted in orange that's activated. Functional magnetic resonance spectrography FMRS uses the same equipment as an MRI but just different computer software to analyze um, the data and look at levels of chemicals in the brain while the subject is thinking. So the photo that you see at the bottom shows what part of the brain is activated in a dyslexic uh, subject as well as the part of the brain activated in the control. All of the technology that has led to discoveries in neuroscience also have led to some new insights for educators. For example, um, the research has indicated that nerve cells are rather malleable and that parts of the brain that may be damaged, um, other parts of the brain take over, so there's some neuroplasticity associated with the brain. Um, research has indicated emotions role in learning as well as how important exercise is to the health of the brain. The development of the brain and the teen brain has been a focus of research the impact of sleep and stress on the brain has been studied and they are coming out with some gender differences both in the structure of the brain and in the way the brains function. Much of this research has made its way into the popular media as well as into educational journals and books over the last 20 years. Um, you see cover stories on major magazines showing the research that's coming from the neurosciences and you all also begin to see um, books in the educational realm as well as journals that are focusing on the topic as well. So what's next? Possibly within the next 10 years we may see a new field of study emerge known as educational neuroscience. Um, Kurt Fisher, who works for the Harvard University Graduate School of Education, uh, is definitely a proponent of this, and his, his quote is that the potentials of brain science for education are indeed enormous, but realizing them requires building a new interdisciplinary science that explicitly links brain science and education in a collaboration with both playing strong roles. So in this course, we're going to take a look at the beginning of the term at the neuroscience research, um, and then we will revisit the topic of educational neuroscience at the end of the term as well.